Good afternoon. Um, okay. I, if you have any preliminary questions, uh, you can ask them now. Otherwise, we just um, go directly to what we were starting to do last time. Okay. So. <coughs> Uh, the goal is to describe wave packets, okay? And we decide to look at an object like this, psi of x being an integral in dk, where k is a one-dimensional variable, hmm? uh, e to the i k x. So k is the wave vector of this plane wave. Okay, this is cosine k x plus i sine x. So you superimpose, you sum infinitely many plane waves. Obviously, you have to decide how, and you do it with this uh, g of k. Okay, the weight function, and for reasons okay which will be clear in a while, you put also a square root of two pi there. Okay, so this is strictly speaking just a Fourier transform hmm, of g of k into psi of x. But seen physically, it's a superposition of plane waves with some weight. In order to proceed with the calculation, we will make a choice for this g of k, and we will select it to be a Gaussian. Okay, so some normalization constant, more about this. Uh, later, mm -hmm. times e to the minus alpha, some constant, k minus k zero square. Okay, so it's a Gaussian centered around some wave vector k zero mm -hmm. with a certain width of the Gaussian that depends on alpha. Okay, in fact, it's inversely proportional to alpha. Mm -hmm. And we have to learn how to calculate this, okay? So let me, uh, the other thing is that I will choose C in order to normalize everything. And the way we insist in normalizing things is the following. For instance, G of K is normalized in such a way that it's square modulus integrated over DK is one, okay? The reason why we insist on normalizing things with the square also will be clear in a while. It's essentially related to the fact that it's not psi that determines the probability that psi modulus square. Mm. Uh, so that is what is needed to be integrated over x, for instance, in this case, and be 1. Mm. And similarly, in spirit, g of k also um, needs to be square. But this is just a, I mean, a technicality and is also a matter of convenience in some sense because everything is linear. If I multiply by some other C, well, Psi gets multiplied by a different factor, but doesn't matter much, okay? So let us start learning how to calculate these integrals. Hmm? And for that, I will appeal to something that you probably uh, know which is the following. If you have this integral, integral over dk of square root of 2 pi e to the minus k square over twice some constant, let me call it sigma k square, okay? How much is this, okay? Um, Almost one, almost one. I mean, if I write it like this, okay, e to the minus y square over two, then this is one, really, okay? But here you see I have k divided by sigma k square. So if, I, if you want, I should here put uh, one over uh, sigma k, huh? And after I do that, I exactly have that integral, okay? So this is one. Uh, you should learn to um, argue also uh, on the dimensions of things, okay? So if here k is a dimensionful object, k 
here, what dimension does it have? One over length, because it multiplies length and the result is just a number, okay? So in the same spirit, uh, this sigma k is the same dimension of, as k. Mm? And you see that this is dimension less. But here there is a dk, which is same dimension as k, okay? And in order for this object to be dimension less, you have to divide by c, okay? okay? So the result should be of the same dimension as k, so sigma k here, okay? Very good. Now, <clears throat> uh, another way of writing it that you sometimes find is the following. Integral in dk, square root of 2 pi, e to the minus a k square over 2. Sometimes you find it this way, just a, a constant a in front, rather than having 1 over sigma k squared there. Well, the result is obviously copied from that, and you simply have uh, a equal to 1 over sigma squared. Therefore, here the result is 1 over square root of a. Mm. Nothing but the same integral. Mm. Now, um, is this the only integral that we can do? No, we can, in fact, play considerably on this um, couple of formulas to learn. To learn, for instance, the following. Um, suppose that I want to do now this integral, integral in dk over square root of 2 pi e to the minus a over 2 k square plus k times some variable, okay, which I call it j. You shouldn't think of it as an integer. It's just some real number, j, okay? So you see this is now a Gaussian with a, an extra linear term. But certainly as far as convergency is concerned, this is not a problem because for very large case, this wins, okay? So in any case, this thing is going to zero huh? and the integral therefore exists. But whenever you see a k square and the k, you start thinking of uh, uh, completing a square, right? And I would like to, you to consider this to be just k. Let's see, you need some j here and you need the square. Let's see. Uh, well, if you put here a minus j over a, the mixed product huh, is what? It's, you see, a minus 2k j over a, huh, which multiplied by this minus a over 2 becomes kj. All right, okay? So what I want? Fantastic. So the, the k square is the same. The kj comes from there, but there is an extra piece, okay? The extra piece that you get from here is e to the minus a over 2, j square over a square, or if you want, j square over 2a, all right? Well, every time you insert something, you should just remove it, and therefore here I have to multiply by j square over 2a. Okay, so this thing here, let me erase the unnecessary things, you can verify is identical to this, okay? The k square, the kj, and the j square from here ca is cancelled by that, all right? Okay, now, uh, this object, therefore, this integral is equal to e to the j square over 2a times the integral in dk over square root of 2 pi mm, of e to the minus a over 2. Now, not k, but k minus j over a square. Now, is this integral fundamentally different from this? No, because you can change variable from k to k minus j over a, just a shift. 
then dk is just the same, uh, the same, exactly the same variable. Uh, and the limits also, I never indicate them. They are always from minus infinity to plus infinity, and obviously a shift doesn't matter. Okay? Good. So this integral is exactly the same as this. So 1 over square root of a. Result, this is e j square over 2i a divided by square root of a. Okay? So if you allow me, I now take this formula. I put the plus kj there. And here I insert j square over 2a. Okay? Obviously, this generalized the previous one. If you take j equals 0, huh, you recover the previous one. Okay? Good. One step more. But now, <coughs> until now, everything is real, okay? So k is a real variable, j is a real constant, and we are happy. Real functions, which can be integrated in this way. But what about if j, instead of being a real quantity, is just purely imaginary, for instance? Suppose that j is equal to i times x. Well, first of all, this suggests why I'm doing that. Because I have here e to the i kx. And here I have, in fact, a Gaussian with some k square piece. So you start understanding where I'm going, where I'm aiming at. OK? Well, um, if j is uh, imaginary, this thing here is e to the i kx. So obviously, there is an imaginary part, a real part. The real part is cosine kx. The imaginary part is sine kx. And therefore, you have really two integrals. But formally, nothing prevents you from doing them. Okay? And in fact, strictly speaking, the result I have derived doesn't use, I mean, in a fundamental way, the fact that the integral was of a real function. I mean, the, the thing is pretty much general. And if j is equal to ix, can just read from the very same formula the following. Integral in dk, square root of 2 pi, e to the minus a k square over 2, um, e to the i kx equal to e to the, now, j is now i times x. When you square, you get minus x square over 2a. Then you have the usual square root of a. OK? Now, this is something that I would like you to notice. It tells, in words, the Fourier transform, this is a Fourier transform, of a Gaussian in k space, OK, is a Gaussian in x. However, one should notice the following thing. Here, there is a factor 2 and a factor 2 the same. but here, there is an a in the numerator, and there the a appears in the denominator, OK? So the width of those Gaussian is reciprocal, OK? Something that is wide in k space is narrow in x space, and vice versa. Something uh, narrow in k space is wide in x space, OK? Because you know that if you exchange this, um, I mean, if a is small, uh, 1 over a is large, and vice versa. OK? So this is a nice uh, formula. It's about Fourier transforms of Gaussians that are still Gaussian, but with a reciprocal width. And please try to, well, remember that you know at least. I don't pretend that you remember every single uh, detail, but at least you should Remember that you know it. And if necessary, indeed, you can reconstruct it with this couple of steps from the original integral equal to 1. Hmm? OK. There is no quantum mechanics in principle here. This is Fourier transform. OK? This is waves. Um, however, you will soon uh, notice that this is, in essence, uh, a statement about Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay? Uncertainty in, in k and uncertainty in x, so in momentum and in position, are reciprocal to each other. And their product 
uh, is bound from below. Okay. Uh, now, this is, I think, all we need uh, to proceed. Okay. So this is all the um, uh, mathematics that we'll uh, use in the next half an hour or so. Mm. Uh, by the way, uh, with this thing, you should, for instance, be able to calculate what is C here. Okay. Just to to show you what is the type of calculation that you would need. Here you have that one should be equal to the integral mm, of what? C square e to the minus 2 alpha k minus k0 square. OK? Well, first of all, again, shifts of k doesn't matter. OK? So this is the same thing as the integral of k square. Next, well, next, uh, next you can use, for instance, uh, well, whatever, the first. Huh? Uh, only you have to be careful. Huh? Um, this thing here, you better call it, for instance, um, 1 over 2 sigma k square. Hmm? And then you have exactly the first formula, okay? So the first formula would tell you that this is equal to c square um, times, there is a square root of 2 that you have there and not here, so you just put it, huh? and then, uh, and then, and then the result is sigma k, okay? So for me, sigma k mm, is related to alpha in this following way, mm. or if you want, sigma k square mm, is equal to 1 over 4 alpha. OK. Well, uh, then you can solve for c, for instance. OK. And if you solve for c, you will determine the fact that c, the normalization constant, is 2 alpha over pi to the power one fourth. Okay. Um, very simple algebra. Okay. This is just a side, band, a, si a side discussion. Okay. So it shows you how to use that formula to calculate the normalization in front. But before I proceed, so let me just uh, put the result here. So C is equal to uh, 2 alpha over pi to the power 1 half, 1 fourth. Um, I leave this there, okay, for a reason. Uh, this way of writing Gaussian is particularly uh, nice because sigma k has a very uh, nice f physical meaning, okay? Sigma k is the width of the Gaussian, okay, and also gives you the second moment. If you have a probability distribution, okay, some, uh, in this case, let me call it P of k, mm, you know that you can calculate uh, moments of the probability distribution, okay? The first moment is usually called the average, okay, and is just a multiplication of the Probability times k. Okay, you always assume that these things are normalized to one, as any probability should be. This is the first moment, k average, the average. The second moment is called usually sigma square, and is integral of k minus the average k square. Okay? You have seen this, okay? This is classical probability. Huh? So it's essentially, it tells you how uh, width is, um, how wide is the distribution uh, around the mean value, okay? Mm -hmm. So if this P of K is something centered around some point, okay, some average K, it tells you something about the spread, the variance, how it's going, okay? Well, 
it's very simple to show that indeed the sigma square defined in this way is exactly, if you take this probability distribution now, so this is, um, this is the P of K, okay? It's a Gaussian um, normalized in this way so that the integral is one, okay? If you, so this is verified, so this for me is the P of K. Let's calculate the average here. The average is how much? Zero. No average, average, not the average square, just the average. Zero, because this is centered in zero. I should redo here the, the plot. If this is k and this is p of k, it is centered in zero, okay? It's something like this. So the average is just zero, okay? Uh, good. Notice, if I do this shift, things change. Huh? If you calculate the average for this distribution, you will find, no surprise, k zero, okay? Not zero, okay? But let's proceed with that because it's simple. So this is just zero in that case. So this disappears. Let us calculate now the integral of k square times p of k, which is that object there. So uh, square root of 2 pi uh, sigma k hmm? uh, e to the minus k square over 2 sigma k square. Now, uh, in order to calculate it, the best thing is if you divide by a sigma k square and you multiply by sigma k square, okay? Now you see that the variable k over sigma k, you can call it y, mm, is always appearing everywhere, okay? So this thing is equal to sigma k square, integral in dy, square root of 2 pi, y square e to the minus y square over 2. Mm. And it doesn't take long to deduce that this integral is exactly equal to 1. Okay, in case, in case you want a, a, a proof of that, uh, one possibility is the following. Take this formula, okay? Put j equal to zero, so the, the previous version, without this, okay? Take a derivative of both sides with respect to a. Hmm? If you take the derivative of this side, you bring down k square in front with the minus and the one half, okay? And it's exactly the integral you want, essentially, integral of k squared. Mm -hmm. The derivative of that side brings, again, a 1 half and a to the minus 3 half. Then put a equal to 1, because you want, after all, here 1. And you will discover that the whole integral is just 1. OK? Very simple derivation. Just uh, please try to do it, because it, it makes you confident that you know how to do things. OK? So the result is that this integral here is just equal to sigma k square, okay? So the width defined in this standard way, second moment, is just sigma k square. The parameter appearing there, okay? This is no surprise, you know, okay, that the physics of the uh, Gaussian width uh, when you write sigma in the denominator in this way is exactly this, the variance, the second moment, okay? This is slightly more physical than uh, writing it this way, okay? Because you have always to remember that alpha is not the width, but is the inverse of the square of the width, with some factors too also, okay? So it's uh, it's better to, um, in some sense, to 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 make reference to this if you want to d discuss about widths rather than to just some alpha there, okay? But you can translate from one to the other in this way. Okay, is this clear? Good. Uh, that's the end of uh, general math mathematics, say, or uh, uh, simple integrals. Now let us approach our calculation. Okay. Uh,
um, let me write here. This, this I, I, I wrote, for, I write for you here. Sigma k square is, so the width of the square of this thing is just 1 over 4 alpha. Okay, so let us calculate now the integral, okay? Psi of x is equal to the integral over dk square root of 2 pi. I will do the, uh, at least this very first calculation in all detail, okay? Um, Later on, probably I will skip some steps, but I encourage you when you do the calculation yourself to always be very, I mean, not skipping too many steps because it's very difficult if you have done a mistake in the skipping to just notice the mistake because it's in the air and not on the page, okay? So please write everything in an orderly fashion, okay? Straight lines, I always see in the homeworks and in the exams, especially if you are in a hurry, lines that start flo flo flying around, the diagonal things, the things that mix, just be ordered, okay? Being very careful in the writing and in the order of your equation is an ingredient, you should, would be surprised, for success, okay? Getting the right answer. Hmm? Okay. And it's also very easy to uh, go again over the calculation and correct the things if something is wrong. If everything is messy, the first equation is here, the second comes there, the third comes wherever in the page, you will never find it, okay? And obviously it's a nightmare for whoever has to grade and, and check, okay? So let's see. This is there. G of k is c, okay? Which, by the way, we know. Then I have e to the minus alpha k minus k0 square. And then I have e to the i kx, okay? Then I want to use uh, that formula there. So before I do that, obviously, I have to get rid of this. Huh? Now, allow me the power of the blackboard to rewrite the k as follows. I have inserted and deleted, okay? So it's added and subtracted k0. So obviously this object here is just e to the i k minus k0x times e to the i k0x. But notice we are integrating over k, not k0. So this is just a constant piece which I can take out, okay? If I do that, I have c e to the i k0x, this one, times integral over dk square root of 2 pi e to the minus alpha um, k minus k0 square e to the i k minus k0x, okay? Clear? Now, these are integral over minus infinity to plus infinity, and the usual trick. If you change variable to, call it k prime equal to k minus k zero, okay, then dk and dk prime are identical. The limits are unchanged by this shift, and therefore this, now I would be tempted, if you allow me, to just substitute here k. Well, maybe I shouldn't do it. I promised that I will do all the steps in the first thing, okay? So this is equal to C, e to the i, k, 0, x, integral in d, k prime, okay? e to the uh, um, minus alpha, k prime square, e to the i, k prime x, okay? <coughs> now, if you allow me, I get rid of the prime, okay? Good. Now we are closer now to that form. And in fact, we can copy essentially now the result. Uh, only uh, careful, here I have a over two, okay? And here I have alpha. This is not a big uh, problem, so uh, let me just uh, copy the result, and wherever I see there A, I should interpret, so the identification is alpha stands wherever 
a over 2 appears there, OK? So if you want, wherever I see a, I should just put 2 alpha, hmm? OK? So let's do it. And I will do it here again. So this is equal to c e to the i k 0 x, OK? And what? Um, e to the minus x square over 2a, but 2a is 4 alpha. And the denominator, I have uh, square root of a, which is square root of 2 alpha. OK? This is the full calculation, exact, no approximation, of the Fourier transform of this Gaussian centered in k0. Let me just uh, do a little bit more, just, just to uh, um, end this thing. And let me write it in the following way. If uh, everything is clear, I erase here. Okay. I re rewrite this as um, 2 alpha over pi to the power 1 fourth divided by uh, 2 alpha to the power 1 half. Mm -hmm. So you see that these two alpha really are uh, related to each other. And you can just uh, uh, cancel the 2 alpha in the num numerator. And this becomes 1 fourth as well. OK? So just put everything here as 2 alpha pi to the power 1 fourth. OK? And e to the i k 0 x e to the minus x squared over 4 alpha. OK? Good. Now, apart from this norm constant, let's examine the result. It is a, like a plane wave, OK? The plane wave with a wave vector, which is k0, the, the, the one on which the weight is centered. OK, remember, this is centered on k0, not on 0. OK, so uh, to, to a first approximation is just a plane wave. So if I draw it, uh, say that I draw the real part, obviously it's complex. Huh? Let's suppose that you draw the real part, it would be a cosine of k0x, something like this. OK? Oscillating forever, obviously, OK? This is x. And this is uh, psi of x, uh, apart from normalization and everything. Just, just this piece. Uh, this quantity here, obviously, is related to k0. It's the lambda 0. Uh, and you know that um, lambda 0 is 2 pi over k0. OK, what about this factor? Well, this factor obviously makes, uh, oh, this is x equals 0. The factor is 1 there. But as you go away, depending on how much is alpha, uh, this Gaussian piece uh, will essentially uh, make all the other oscillation to be smaller and smaller, OK? So if I were to draw this, OK, depending on alpha, it would be something like, 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 like this. And then here, maybe smaller. Here is even smaller. Here is even smaller. OK, I don't know. I mean, OK? Something like this. Symmetric. OK? Very, very small as you go away. So you see that the thing oscillates, but also vanishes as you move away, hmm? which is what we want to describe, OK? It's a wave, but it's also a packet, something that is essentially localized in a certain region of space, depending on alpha. Hmm? I, I draw a, a kind of extreme case, where alpha is such that, uh, well, essentially, you see only the central part. But if alpha is uh, uh, very uh, large, uh, 
if alpha is very large, then uh, notice the width of this Gaussian hmm, is directly related to alpha. You could write this as e to the minus, well, I should make a, a, a let me first look at the, uh, the psi modulus square. If I look at psi modulus square, okay, which is simple, in fact, this is the modulus square of this, the modulus of the uh, e to the ik axis, one, okay, so this is um, uh, uh, one over two alpha pi to the power one half times e to the minus x square over two alpha, okay? So immediately see alpha is the width in x space, okay, directly. It is what I call the width. Hmm? And if you draw it, so it's not it, no longer this, but it's something that doesn't oscillate. If you draw it, it's a, a simple Gaussian, okay, where the width of the Gaussian is uh, controlled by alpha, okay? So if this is sigma, is the square root of alpha. Mm -hmm. So large alpha means a large width, many oscillations before you see the decay. Small alpha uh, means a small Gaussian, means very few oscillations and then nothing, okay? Is this clear? Okay. Uh, notice one thing, for this Gaussian wave packet, the width in uh, k space, okay, sigma k, is how much? Is one over two square root of alpha. The width in x space is square root of alpha. So sigma x is square root of alpha. The product of the two widths, hmm? how much is it? Sigma k times sigma x equal to one half. Okay. This is probably reminds you of Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which in more general terms tells you that the variance of the momentum hmm, um, square, square root uh, times the square root of the variance of the position hmm, is bound to be greater than h bar over two. The two is the same. What is missing here is an h bar and the h bar is due to the fact that here I'm looking at k and not at p. p and k have an h bar uh, in between, okay? So this is essentially the lowest bound in Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? So those Gaussians that I have constructed realize the minimum uncertainty possible in Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? Um, is everything clear until now? Okay. So this is like a photograph of our wave packets at a given time. As you see, time has no up, made no appearance until now. Hmm? It's a fixed time object. Okay. Now let me um, consider time. There is a few things. Um, um, should I keep this? Well, you have written. I, I will rewrite when, whenever I will need it. I need some space. Okay, and I uh, keep. I keep this. Now, let us start considering a single plane wave. The usual way you uh, consider the time dependence of something like this is, uh, for instance, by 
considering again a, 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 a cosine and sine dependence on, on, on time in this form, okay? Omega in general depends on k, okay? Let me indicate it by omega of k. Hmm? Now, let's see what is the meaning of omega of k. Let me do the following. Let's put the k in front of everything, and then obviously here I have omega k divided by k t. Now this is probably already suggestive. Hmm? You see, x minus something t. Hmm? You would be tempted to call this v of k. Looks like a velocity. Dimensionally, it's a velocity. Okay? So you call it v of k is called phase velocity. Hmm? What does it mean? It means the following. If I have at a certain time, say, t equals 0, this object uh, at position x 0, OK, hmm? at t equals 0, at what time hmm, and at what position I will have exactly the same value for this number, for this phase. Huh? At what time and at what x? Well, obviously, I want x minus vkt to be exactly equal to x0, OK? So t has increased, x has changed, but their uh, difference in this way should be just x0. So the place x where I have exactly the same phase as the original one at time t, however, is just equal to x0 plus vkt, OK? So just to, if I have a certain uh, function, OK? I take it at a certain place x0. Hmm? The same value is moving, OK, with time at a phase velocity vk. You see, looks like a simple motion in time, OK? Time equals 0 is this, and then it moves. All right? This is clear. Uh, OK, let us uh, insist. Uh, I still don't know what omega of k behaves in k. And therefore, I don't know v of k as a function of k. Let us assume that there is such a thing. OK, now I pretend to calculate the same thing now, but with time, OK? Same calculation in spirit, but with time now present there. Uh, how do we do? Well, <clears throat> let's observe a few things. If this phase velocity mm, is the same for every uh, k, mm, so essentially if v of k is just a constant, let me call it c, for a reason that will be clear in a second. Doesn't depend on k. Then I can do exactly this transformation there. OK, so I have e to the i k x minus ct, OK, because the phase velocity is constant in k. Mm? And therefore, you see that the integral in k is identical to what I have done before. OK, exactly the same calculation except that now wherever I had x, I should put x minus ct, OK? So immediately conclude that whenever the phase velocity doesn't depend on k, but it's just a constant, the wave at position x and at time t is exactly equal to the same wave at time t equals 0, but at position x minus ct. OK? Is this clear? It's telling you simply that as time advances, the wave simply moves, shifts rigidly, OK? With the common velocity c. Whenever this happens, you say that the wave does not disperse. So this is a non-dispersive 
wave. Okay? So whatever signal you have, a complicated wave, if every phase velocity is identical, then the signal simply shifts and moves rigidly. Okay? Non-dispersive waves. Now, this happens for electromagnetic waves in vacuum. Okay? Every phase velocity is the same. It's the velocity of light. Okay? And the wave moves as a whole with the velocity of light. Okay? Notice, electromagnetic waves in vacuum. If you are in a material, that's no longer true in general. Materials are called also dispersive media in the sense that the index of refraction depends on k in general, and therefore the velocity of each single k value uh, is different in general from k to k. Mm? And you do no longer have uh, just a uniform shift. The wave uh, has a tendency to disperse, to broaden, to... Okay? So not only a rigid movement, but some broadening and things like this. Okay? Which is characteristic of dispersive media. So whenever C of K is different from just a constant, V of K. Okay? By the way, if you reread in terms of omega of K, uh, this K... This case simply means omega of k equal to k times c. Perfectly linear in k, okay? With a slope that is the velocity c, okay? This is the non-dispersive k, light in vacuum. Now, this is not certainly going to help in describing and non-relativistic electron traveling, okay? For a very simple reason. Electrons do not travel at the velocity of light, okay? And the momentum, I, I would like to have something for which the velocity with which something moves is essentially the momentum divided by the mass. You see there is no mass, no momentum here. I mean, everything moves with the velocity of light, the common velocity. That's not non-relativistic quantum mechanics, non-relativistic motion. Mm? So I should look for something different for this object, okay? This cannot be just a linear function, okay? Let's see. Let's, I don't know the answer, and whenever I don't know the answer, I should try to derive it, okay? Let's see how. Um, I don't know it, but I know that this is a function of k that, in principle, I should be able to expand. Uh, expand where? Well, uh, remember, this is a Gaussian that I am integrating. So there is an integral in dk with a Gaussian that centers everything into k0. Mm? And this is this function of k that I am looking at. Okay, well, suppose that this Gaussian is pretty narrow. Mm? So I'm integrating everything, some function, and then there is this Gaussian that makes everything quite narrowly peaked around k0. Well, then wh whatever this function has, in fun as far as k is concerned, I can think that I will never go too far away from k equals 0, okay? So my guess is that let's expand omega k close to this point. Okay, so this would be some omega k0 plus, uh, should I erase here? Yes, I need. <coughs> plus what? Well, uh, the derivative mm, at k0 times k minus k0 plus, well, second derivative times k minus k0 plus, in principle, everything, but as always in this kind of calculation, you stop, you stop at the lowest reasonable level where you can perform a calculation, have all the necessary ingredients, but, I mean, you have to stop, okay? So this is a constant. I can treat it. 
this is a term in k minus k0, it's okay, k minus k0 is there. This is still k minus k0 and it's squared, and it's okay, because after all, this is still Gaussian-like, okay? So I can keep exactly these three terms hmm, in the calculation without any problem. If I include k, k minus k0 cube, I would be in trouble, because the integral would have exponential blah, blah, blah cubed, which is more difficult. Okay? So I stop there. The justification that the narrowness of G justifies just keeping only those terms. Okay? That's what we can do and we do it. All right. Uh, let me uh, eliminate this because I do have to make space. Okay. So let us do the calculation now with uh, this expansion there, okay? So once again, some passion. Uh, there is the C, there is the integral, square root of 2 pi. Uh, there is the e to the minus alpha k minus k0 square from g. Then there is e to the i. Let's see, k, x, um, why do I want to write it this way? No. Um, k, x, minus, okay, this is omega k0, plus, we call this object, uh, formally, is like a velocity. You see, it's a frequency divided by k. Remember the velocity, the phase velocity v of k was omega k divided by k. Now is a derivative, however. Let me call it vg. g stands for group. This is the group velocity as opposed to the phase velocity that I had introduced before, okay? But just a name. And this quantity here, where is it? Okay, uh, let me just shorten it to beta, some constant, hmm? beta. Okay, so this is d plus vg uh, k minus k0. Uh, there is a t always, okay, let me put it everywhere. t, t plus beta k minus k0 square, and again t, okay? So let us look. Uh, yeah. Yes, there will be. Okay. It will come in um, three to five minutes, depending on the uh, slowness that I have. Okay. It is related to the curvature. You see. I mean, if this was just linear, uh, second derivative zero. So it has to do with the curvature of the dispersion omega k versus k. Mm? And you will see in a second that it's related to h bar and to the mass of the particle. Very short um, discussion will come. Okay, so let us see. Almost everything is now function of k minus k0, but this is a guy here, but I know how to make it a function of k minus k0, right? Remember the trick, just put minus k0 x, and obviously you have to put e to the i k0 x out also, okay? So I introduce it. Well, once I have done this, well, first of all, let me change variables to k minus k0, which I should call k prime, but please allow me, just call it k. Hmm? So the integral is c e to the i k0 x integral over a new variable k, which I keep calling k, hmm? e to the minus alpha k square, and then I have e to the i kx. Oh, what about this? Well, this is in fact not integrated at all. It's just a function. Okay, let me put it out then. Okay, make some space more. C e to the i k0x, 
minus omega k zero t. Okay, so I get rid of this. Uh, good. Then I have minus v g k uh, t. The t I put it here. Okay. And then I have minus beta, and I have t, and I have k square. This is k minus k zero, but it, it has become k. Hmm? So let's see. Hmm. First of all, here I have x minus vgt times k. Okay. So uh, let me rewrite this. C e to the i k zero x minus omega k zero t integral square root of two pi. Let's see, this piece is e to the i k multiplying x minus v g t, which is nice, right? It's just x shifted by this group velocity. Hmm. Uh, this t square here, k square, oh, sorry, goes with this k square, same, same, same thing, except that I have to correctly account the fact that alpha appears here, and here I have minus i beta t, all right? Am I doing thing correct, things correctly? I think uh, uh, so. So if I put the minus in front is plus i beta t, and then I have a k, okay? Very good. So does this integral uh, look in any way similar to what we have on the board? Well, yes, yes, yes. Mm. You see, it's essentially this integral. Now, you might object. In that integral, I was assuming A to be a real constant. At least A was real. Mm. Then the J there it was imaginary, but A was real. And there was an important uh, reason why A is real. For instance, if A is purely imaginary, then this thing is no longer a Gaussian dying, but something oscillating. And the integral maybe doesn't exist. But as long as this quantity A has a real part that is positive, not necessarily just real, but a real part that is positive, so think of this as a complex A belonging to the complex number, but where the real part of A mm, is just positive. Would you be happy with that? Of course, yes, because the main thing, okay, the real part of A times K squared makes the thing very nicely uh, going to zero. The imaginary part makes some oscillation, but the overall uh, real part, uh, come, you can separate it in product of things. This makes things converging nicely, okay? So you can even enlarge your assumptions and say this formula is okay as long as A is even complex, but with a positive real part. And all of the sudden, this comes, in fact, complex, but the real part is alpha. Mm. See, this is a purely imaginary piece. Alpha is the same alpha there, so obviously positive, right? So alpha here, I always imagine alpha to be positive. Mm. So the real part mm, is positive, no problem. So I can use the formula, okay? I'm, do I'm, I'm now going to use it, mm. and I have to uh, where did I put the, here. Okay. <clears throat> now, so uh, follow me. Here, I put, so there is this C, 
there is this e to the i k0 x minus omega k0 t. And then application of that formula, just remind you that here I have something and there I have a over 2, the usual dictionary. Uh, read a over 2 in place of this and vice versa. And the result is e to the minus uh, x square, well, not x really, this quantity square. So x minus vgt square divided by 2a. Well, a uh, should be reread from there. And uh, believe me, the, it becomes um, 2 alpha plus i b t. OK? This is a. Whenever you see a, you have to put um, 2 alpha plus i b t. OK? Or 2 times 2, 4. OK? And what about, well, there is this 1 over square root of a. So in the denominator here, I should put 1 over square root of uh, a, which is 2 alpha plus i beta t. OK? Well, obviously, for t equals 0, you should recover the previous result, OK? So if I put t equals 0 there, 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 check is exactly the previous formula. Mm? But now this is well, much richer. For instance, it's telling you one thing. First of all, if you take the modulus square of it, so let us start looking at the modulus square. So the modulus square of psi x and t. Well, then this uh, e to the i factor uh, it just gives you a 1. Um, what about the modulus square of, of, of the rest? Well, c squared is obvious. Huh? Here I have to be a little bit more careful. These are complex uh, quantities, in particular a complex square root. So to take the most square, you have to multiply by the star of it and do the appropriate algebra uh, without getting uh, wrong things. Uh, please uh, verify, OK? that if you put the c that I've given you there, you will obtain the following thing. 1 over square root of 2 pi, square root of alpha divided by alpha square plus beta square t square. This alpha square plus beta square t square come when you multiply alpha plus i beta times the star of it, which is alpha minus i beta t. Okay. You take this, the, the product, you get alpha square plus p, beta square t square. Okay? Typical things. Then you have e to the minus um, alpha over 2x minus vg t square divided by, again, alpha square plus beta square t square. Okay? So please verify that the complex. Um, calculation, it's um, nothing but this. OK? And now you see the point. First of all, this is a Gaussian which is centered around what? VGT. OK? So the center of this Gaussian is moving, however, with the velocity that is not the phase velocity of any k, but the group velocity. So the object that matters is the derivative of omega k with respect to k at the important momentum k0, OK? And this is what moves the center of the Gaussian. However, you see that whenever beta is different from 0, and notice the sign doesn't matter because it's beta squared that always appears, at least in this modulus square, the width of this Gaussian increases, OK? You see this is 1 over 2, uh, the width square. The width is increasing, OK? So not only the wave packet modulus square is moving, but is also broadening, OK? And this is due to the fact that there is a beta different from 0, or if you want, there is a second derivative different from 0, OK? Good. Um, 
Now, so this is called spreading, spreading of a wave packet. The wave packet sooner or later will be just very, very, very broad if t becomes very, very large. Okay, you could play around a lot with this form. Uh, for instance, if you are uh, knowledgeable about computers, you could try to uh, draw these things as a function of time and see how the thing evolves in time, okay, and play a little bit around with this subject. Um, but uh, what I want to point to you now is that we still have to determine how can we describe a non-relativistic particle. Now, you know that for a non-relativistic particle, mm, the velocity should be equal to the momentum divided by the mass, right? And the momentum, according to De Broglie, mm, was just equal to h bar, the k. But what is the important k here? You see, it's k zero. The overall oscillation is with k zero, okay? So I really want this. I want that the velocity with which this thing is moving is related to its k zero by h bar k zero divided by m. This velocity is the group velocity, by the way. Hmm? Okay, the group velocity is the derivative of omega k with respect to k at k zero. Can we solve this? So how is it, how should I take omega k in such a way that this derivative at k zero is just h bar k zero? The square, right? Let's see. Omega k equal to h bar k square over 2m, okay? If I take a derivative, I bring down the 2, and this cancels the 2, and I get, so the derivative of omega k with respect to k is just h bar k over m, and if I evaluate at k0, I get exactly what I want, okay? So here is the solution. Omega k should not be the straight line you saw above. It should be this important um, h bar k square over 2m, okay? A parabola, okay? You see that the mass appears there, okay? And the h bar appears there, all right? What is beta? Well, let's see, beta is equal to one half, a further derivative. So if the, the first derivative is this, okay, let's put a second derivative, I get another k off, so it's one half h bar over m, okay? So the parameter which uh, gets for you the spreading of the wave packet is just h bar over m, apart from a factor two. Hmm? The higher the mass, obviously, the, sm the smaller is beta. Hmm? In fact, a very, very large mass means a beta that is very, very, very small. In a second, I will try to get you some numbers to understand how really this thing can vary in a dramatic way if you consider small but classical things or electrons, okay? Uh, for the time being, let me just pause for a second and ask if you are followed until now, okay? So unlike photons that have a, in vacuum a linear dispersion, electrons, non-relativistic electrons to be described, you should take HK be a parabola, okay? By the way, if I insist in, um, remember that AE was just H bar omega, okay? So if I call h bar omega k, I, I see that this is equal to h bar square k square over 2m. And once again, if I use the Broglie, h bar k is the momentum. And so this is just the momentum square over 2m, okay? Reasonable. The energy, which is h bar omega, 
is just p square over 2m, the classical um, kinetic energy. Okay? Makes sense. <coughs> okay? So the message in order to describe a wave packet of a non relativistic particle, which should mimic something that classically behaves like uh, the usual uh, objects you know, you should take the dispersion omega k to be uh, h bar k square over twice the mass. Okay, so let's do this very simple um, exercise, numerical now. So, what do I erase? Um, let me, uh, before I erase that, um, how do I write the spread in X? Huh? Uh, the, say, the spread square in X at a certain time T. Hmm? How do I uh, read it from that? Remember, the rule is... It, we should have e to the minus x squared divided by twice the spread, okay? So I can read it directly, and this is equal to what you have in the denominator, but obviously uh, divided by alpha, okay? So in other words, you write it like this, which is equivalent, okay? This quantity here is the square of the spread at time t. At time zero, obviously, you have just alpha, the usual thing here, okay? The previous result. Now, huh? where is it? No, because uh, I always take the factor two out in the definition of the width. Okay, the Gaussians always have the one half explicitly out and then the width. Yeah, th this was there because in K you have a factor one half, okay? But in X, you know, there is no one half, okay? All right, um, so this is the correct formula that I can read from there. And it reduces to, to this one when T is equal to zero. Notice this is the square, that is the square root of this, okay? Okay, so I write this as alpha plus uh, beta square t square over alpha, mm. or if I want delta x at times t, I take the square root and I get square root of alpha plus beta square t square of alpha. Okay? Just simple manipulations of the same expression. All right. Now, consider a Gaussian wave packet which is describing. Um, Three possible things. The first thing that you might want to describe is uh, an electron, okay? So for an electron, the mass, how much is the mass? Roughly 9, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, okay? And suppose that the initial spreading, so the delta x at a certain time zero was, I don't know, two possibilities. In possibility A, uh, it is, for instance, 10 to the minus 5 meters. And in possibility B, mm, same mass, uh, but uh, the delta x, the initial spreading, is 10 to the minus 10 meters. When angstrom, okay? Now we are atomic size. This is still, I mean, 10 microns, so pretty large on atomic scale. And then I have a possibility C that is a small but macroscopic object. So, for instance, an object whose mass is 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, a gram, okay? 
and the initial spreading of the way packet is, for instance, well, it doesn't matter much. 10 to the minus 3 meters, a millimeter, okay? So uh, something of a gram and spreading on a millimeter. I would like to know what happens as time goes by now, okay? So let us calculate. This one? Yes. Okay. Uh, I read from this formula, okay, which I rewrote. The, the question was, how do I get this expression here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so I start from this expression where there was an alpha here, which I put in the denominator there, okay? And now I say, whatever appears here, by definition, is the sigma x square, is the square of the width of the Gaussian, okay? And to give a slightly different name, I call it delta x square at times t. So this is just the sigma square x at time t, obviously, okay? So I just read it from that denominator. Mm? Alpha square plus beta square t square over alpha, okay? And then this is just a simple step. Mm? If I take the square root, uh, because that's the square of the width, uh, then I have a square root. Okay. So goal is to calculate the relative, oops, I erase one formula here, which was useful, one half h bar over m. Okay, the second derivative of uh, omega. Okay, now. Let me uh, proceed here. So I want to calculate the delta x at times t minus the delta x at time zero divided by the delta x at time zero. The reason why I do that is because this is much simpler. I mean, it's the relative, you see, this is how much the width has increased with respect to the original one divided by the original one. So it's the relative increase, okay? Now, according to my formulas, I have this equal to square root of alpha plus beta square t square over alpha minus a time zero, this is not there, so I have square root of alpha divided by square root of alpha. And then if I eliminate the alpha here, I get, square root of, so, 1 plus beta square t square over alpha square, okay, I have divided this by square root of that, alpha minus 1, okay? This is the relative increase. One warning, whenever I was uh, giving this exercise to do at home in the past years, what I was obtaining is the following. You start from here, and you immediately put all numbers inside, okay? Everywhere. As a result of that, this is full of 10 to the minus uh, 31 squared, and then blah, blah, blah. And after a little bit of space, obviously, I mean, the powers of 10 were missed, and... Uh, it was a mess after a very short time. So it was impossible to get to a result that in the end, if you refrain from putting your constant immediately in the formulas, okay, please do it whenever it's absolutely essential. The first thing you have to do is to do the, your algebra with less numbers than possible, okay? So just use alpha and beta and t and proceed. Once you are here, now there is nothing else but putting what is alpha, what is beta, what is the, so h bar, m, you have to do it, okay? But before, no, there's no need. I can simplify alpha. And, okay, so let me just do it. The crucial thing to, for this relative increase is this factor here, okay? Beta square times... Um, uh, t square alpha, alpha square. So let me concentrate on it. 
Uh, beta square is one fourth h bar square over the mass square, and this is t square, and this is alpha square, so the initial spreading. So let me call it delta x zero square. Okay, so that's the important thing. I should compare this quantity to one. Obviously, if this is very small, then square root of one plus something very small, I can expand and do. If this is large, then the square root is very different from one, and I should calculate. Let's see. H bar in um, international units is uh, one point uh, ten to the minus thirty-four. Okay, appropriate uh, action units. Uh, it would be 10 to the minus 27 in uh, CGS, okay? Uh, now, when I put, there is here some one point something, which I don't care. Okay, let, let's put it there. So I have uh, one fourth, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 68. I don't put the units, it's the uh, action units, so whatever, energy times time, okay? So the units of H bar. Hmm. Let me indicate like that. Um, so, by the way, this whole quantity uh, sh should be sum to one, so it's dimensionless, hmm? no dimension. So the overall result is just a number. That's the reason why I don't even put the dimensions there. Okay, then there is a factor four, then, then there is the, the mass, then there is the time square. Hmm? There is the mass and the spreading. Okay, let's do the, let's do first the case of uh, um, uh, electrons. Hmm? Then this is nine square, so 81. Then it is uh, 10 to the minus 62. Uh, obviously, uh, kilogram square. Uh, and then there is this delta x zero squared. So let's now now the different case uh, are distinguished. Okay. So for instance, in the first case, I have here um, ten to the minus five squared, which is ten to the minus ten. Okay. So you see that here I have 68 and here I have 72. Uh, so for t reasonably small, this is small, but as t becomes of the order of, say, um, um, 10 or 100 or so, I mean, this starts to be, uh, this starts to be considerably uh, large, okay? You can calculate the exact uh, thing when this, for instance, becomes one. You can calculate when this becomes one. Okay, you can you can do it. If the ma if the initial spreading is ten to the minus ten, okay, it's even worse. This is ten to the minus twenty. Okay, so now this is large uh, because remember this go. Uh, I mean up because this is divided by a smaller quantity. So even for t of order one, this is already large. So you ha should have, I mean, very, very small times, okay? So you see that uh, uh, you have, that this is of order one when t square is of order, let's see, forget about this uh, uh, numbers. Well, this is 10 to the two roughly. So this is 10 to the, mm, 10 to the minus 82, uh, 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 well, uh, times 100, so 10 to the minus 80, say, something like this, divided by uh, 10 to the minus 68, okay? So 10 to the minus uh, 12, okay? So of order t, 10 to the minus 6, whenever uh, time of order 10 to the minus 6 second already this term is as big as the original one, okay? Uh, okay, what about the microscopic but classical object? Well, I have now, I erase here, 
rather than 10 to the minus 62, I have 10 to the minus 6 kilograms square. And here I have uh, 10 to the minus 3 meters, so 10 to the minus 6 again meters square. Mm -hmm. So you see I have 6 and 6, 12, okay? And this is 10 to the minus 68, okay? So the overall thing is 10 to the minus 54 or uh, whatever, 56, okay? And obviously I need the time of the order of 10 to the 27 mm, in order for this to be one, which is astronomically large, 10 to the 27 seconds, okay? I mean, you can calculate how many seconds there are in a year, in a century, okay, in a millennium, and this is much larger than that, okay? So you see how a mass of order a gram, which is small, is so much larger than the mass of the electron, and especially for the fact that there are squares here, the spreading of a classical-like object is totally useless, I mean, you can forget about it, but if you are in the atomic world, in the world of electrons, where the masses are so small, then the fact that H bar is so small is, is very important, okay? And, and you can, uh, I mean, as far, the fact that H bar is small, but not infinitely small. I mean, if H bar was essentially zero, then no quantum effects, you see, okay? Because this would be just, just zero, huh? But no, this is not zero, and uh, the small mass makes uh, the, the, the result um, uh, exploding with time very fast. Okay. Is this clear to everybody? Okay. So the role of the mass and of H bar in this spreading uh, hopefully was clear from this exercise. Okay. So uh, I would... Uh, end the lecture here. Next time, we start with the Schrodinger equation. This was not the proof of the Schrodinger equation, but we are essentially at the verge of introducing the Schrodinger equation in a way that is more understandable than just uh, writing it. Okay? Um, in some sense, uh, we can immediately show, and we'll do it next time, that this wave packet that I have written here, this one, okay, uh, when h bar, when omega k is equal to h bar k square over 2m, as I have uh, um, insisted, uh, then this object here solves the following equation. The derivative with respect to time of psi x and t is equal to minus h bar square over 2m, the second derivative with respect to x of psi x and t, okay? Which is the Schrodinger equation for a particle in vacuum, so no potential. Hmm? We'll show it this next time. And in fact, this is the most general solution of this equation. Hmm? So it's a superposition of plane waves with an arbitrary g of k, by the way, not necessarily Gaussian. The specific calculation we have done for Gaussian was because we could do the algebra, I mean, till the end. But in principle, any g of k is allowed, and is a solution of this, okay? We'll do next time. Uh, so if there are questions, otherwise we see. Right. Okay. The question was, we stopped in our expansion of omega k to second order. What would be the result if we proceed to third order? Well, and more. And more. First of all, it happens to be that the correct non-relativistic limit is exactly quadratic in k. So the third order is exactly zero. This would be a semi-answer because, after all, uh, life is not completely non-relativistic. The dispersion of particles, as Einstein has um, 
explain to us would be that the energy is um, the square root of p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. Okay? I'm sure you have uh, seen this at least in this form. Okay? If you put the momentum equal to zero, so the rest energy of a particle of mass m is e m c squared. Okay? It's many t-shirts about uh, Einstein. Okay? Okay, so this is the energy associated to the mass. And then there is this p squared term in this form. Now, you might ask, uh, where do I get this p squared over 2m from? Hmm? Uh, look, if I, usually this is very large, okay? For electrons, mc squared is uh, mega electron volts, very large energy, which are not very important, however, unless you break electrons, you, you produce electrons, unless you do high energy uh, scattering of electrons, where this energy can be released, okay? For condensed matter, er electrons are never broken, okay? Or never paired with positrons, or never disappearing. They are there all the time, and they move at relatively low speed, okay? And therefore, you never involve this rest energy as an important energy in your thing. So let's do the exercise. Just put mc square in front, OK? So this is 1 plus uh, p square c square divided by um, m uh, squ uh, square c to the fourth, right? OK? It's the same thing that I have written. Mm -hmm. C square. OK? So this is uh, mm, like that. Mm. Now let me expand for small p. Mm. So this is equal to mc square. The expansion of the square root is 1 plus 1 half p square over m square c square plus a term of order. Uh, the square of this, so p square over mc square c square squared. Mm? When I, I think there is a 1 over 8 factor, but it doesn't matter. Now, look, this piece is exactly the t-shirt, mc square. Mm? Now, what about this? mc square, the c square and dc square cancels here, and the m cancels the m square and becomes p square over 2m, okay? C disappears huh? because this is not relativistic, and you see you have the nice expression. Okay, so this object starts from the rest energy, mc square, and then it has the parabola that I drew before. Hmm? If you insist and you go to very, very large momenta, will not go forever quadratic. Sooner or later you will see that it straightens, okay, after all when this is much larger than this. It becomes, again, p times c, like the photon. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that limit, it would make sense to ask, uh, again, your question. The, the, the quadratic term, it doesn't leave forever. And, but at this point, non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics breaks down in some sense, and I should do a full relativistic Dirac theory of... Uh, quantum mechanics, which is not what we are going to do in any case, okay? So the spreading of uh, a wave packet in relativistic quantum mechanics is another calculation, okay? Uh, it, you have to account for this in full detail, not just the third order term, and uh, it's a complete. Uh, no, is? no. It's a completely different uh, thing, and... Uh, to be honest, uh, I mean, I um, haven't looked at it in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, maybe. So I would not adventure in discussing the physics of it. Okay? Other questions? If not, so we see each other tomorrow again. Okay? Bye-bye. Thank you.